All right. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good evening. And uh, thank you, Prof. Mio, for your kind words. And uh, I think, first of all, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Simarjit Singh, the chairman of our Medical Education Unit at UNICAR, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk to this August uh, Assembly of uh, Academicians. Um, as uh, you all know, and it's there on the screen, we are going to talk about the conduct of TBL and PBL sessions, how we can do that uh, effectively. Now, please don't take it as a, as a lecture. Uh, you can start me wherever you feel like asking some question and we can discuss. All right, now before uh, uh, going to this, going on to discuss this topic, let me share the results of the survey, uh, which I conducted just for this webinar. And the purpose was to assess the knowledge and level of exposure of the participants uh, in this webinar to help me organize uh, the session. Now, the, uh, there were seven respondents, uh, and as you can see, the four of them are uh, assistant professors, uh, two professors and uh, one associate professor. And the question, the familiarity with, with the uh, TBL and uh, you can see the four of the respondent have already conducted TBL sessions. Um, uh, one is familiar with TBL session and to say they are not familiar with, with TBL. So this uh, means that uh, my task is to address the, the concerns and needs uh, from novice to, to, to the experts. So uh, the range of uh, points to be mentioned in, in discussion. Uh, coming to problem-based learning, the five of the respondents, they have conducted PBL sessions, so they have quite good experience in that. Uh, one is familiar and other is not familiar. So again, the scope of discussion will range from novice to, to expert. So, and that's what I will uh, try to achieve uh, in this session. Coming to the learning outcomes based on uh, uh, the survey results, first, the participants would be able to explain the underlying principles of TBL approach in teaching learning sessions, describe the process of conduct of a TBL session, describe the process of conduct of a PBL session, compare the conduct of TBL session with a PBL session and uh, conduct a TBL and PBL sessions effectively and efficiently. And we will try to achieve these learning outcomes in, in, in this session. Now let's start with, with the team-based learning first. Uh, the, what was the concept? And this is the statement which clearly gives the idea what TBL is all about. Classroom time needs to be used for solving problems and not just transmittal of information. So this is uh, exactly sort of opposite what we have been doing in the, the traditional uh, curriculum. Now the classroom is not meant for transmission of uh, information, but for solving problem, this means that the the students should be familiar with the information required before coming to the classroom so that they can uh, solve the problems. So that is the first uh, principle uh, of uh, uh, team-based learning. Second, let's uh, go through this concept of uh, uh, zone of proximal development and scaffolding. Uh, it, it is, uh, again, a very fundamental principle here. And uh, this concept was introduced by this Russian psychologist, Vygotsky. Uh, now, here we see the three circles here. And this can apply to any topic 
we want to teach our students. First, may, uh, we can divide this, this topic into, let's say, three areas. One can be very easy part, and many students may be familiar with that already. Second is the what we call a zone of proximal development, and this is the area where students really need help uh, in terms of uh, uh, knowledge and in terms of usage of technology and tools. And third, maybe the area which is beyond uh, their reach at that particular moment. Now, if I, we look at this, so the first one, what I can learn on my own, this is the, the students, uh, which they know or they can learn their own. And we do not need to spend a lot of time on this because this might be a boring for the students as well. So the second part is zone of proximal development is really the area where students need our help and guidance to learn that part, right? So we need to concentrate on, on this part. The associated concept of scaffolding here is that it's a process in which teachers demonstrate or model how to solve a problem and then step back and offering support as needed. Important point here is offering support as needed. So once uh, giving demonstration to the students are giving the information and then giving them a problem to solve and let them solve the problem themselves, we help only where it is needed. Otherwise we, and that is what is meant by, by scaffolding means helping the students whenever they need it. Otherwise, we let them uh, go through the problem themselves. And the theory is that when students are given the support they need while learning something new, they stand a better chance of using that knowledge independently. The second important point about scaffolding is that it is a variety of instructional techniques, it means there can be many, many methods to help students to move students progressively towards stronger understanding and ultimately greater independence in learning process means that the purpose is to train students and enable them to handle the situations independently. So these are three important points uh, which would help us to understand the concept of team-based learning. Uh, Team-based learning is an active learning, a small group instructional strategy that provides students with opportunities to learn a concept and apply the newly learned conceptual knowledge through a sequence of activities that include individual work, our group teamwork, and immediate feedback. So this is actually an operational uh, definition of, uh, of TBL that how uh, TBL is conducted. Uh, we can break down this into uh, small portions. First, it is an active learning process. Second, it is a small group instructional strategy. Third, it provides students uh, the opportunities to learn a new concept and at the same time, soon after learning, apply the newly learned conceptual knowledge through a sequence of activities, uh, which we will go through that, uh, what activities uh, are included in TBL so that we can see the student's ability to apply the, the knowledge what they have learned recently. So TBL is specially or specifically characterized by three components. The three components, important components of team-based learning. First one, individual advanced student preparation. So students have to make some preparation before the session. Individual and group readiness assurance test, which we call IRAT and GRAT. And third, the team decision-making and application of knowledge, RTF. So I will 
explain all these, these three steps. But at the moment, the first students have to make a preparation for the session. Second, they have to go through both as individual and as a group to assess their readiness, uh, whether they have learned what they need to learn. And third, to see whether they can apply what they have learned. So three uh, specific or characteristic steps. Uh, this uh, diagram uh, emphasizes the same concept. Phase one, where there is a pre-class individual study. Then phase two, where there is a individual readiness assurance test, group readiness assurance test, and mainly the explanation by the instructor or, or the facilitator. And third is the assessment of application. And this is mainly based on the student's activity, the team application exercise. The sequence of activities in a, in a TBL session, we can enumerate them. First, advance assignment uh, for the students. So they, they have to prepare and read and go through the material given to them. Whereas for staff, they have to prepare two sets of questions. The, if we use the Bloom's taxonomy, the cognitive uh, levels, the first set is mainly to assess the comprehension of the students. And second set of questions to assess the ability to apply or analyze or evaluate. So two sets of questions uh, which need to be prepared by, by the lecturers. Step two is identification of small groups and group leaders. Step three is individual readiness assurance test, which, where we use the set one of the questions prepared earlier. Step four is group readiness assurance test. Again, the same set of question is used. In step three, it was on individual, individually using the uh, our answering and step four where the same questions are being answered by the group. And then step five, that we display the results of set one of a group, not of an individual. And uh, here, after displaying these results, the teacher, our facilitator, explains or clarify the question uh, which were used in a group assurance test, that is the step one. And then Next step, the step seven is the team application set. Now here is the, the second set of questions is used. And the, the groups or teams, they answer these questions by consensus. And then their result is displayed. And then discussion on the, uh, uh, the team application answers. Uh, then there is a wrap up session and then is the debriefing and 12 is appealing. So these are the 12 steps uh, which we go through uh, in our team-based learning session. I will try to explain each step uh, briefly. The step one, which is advanced assignment and preparation, students receive a list of learning activities. For example, a topic along with learning outcome, that's important. We simply don't give them uh, a topic to read or a video to watch or whatever, but we must give the learning outcomes, means students should know what is expected uh, uh, out of them when, when, while they are going through this assignment. And learning activities, which may include readings, watching videos, lab work, tutorials, or even some previous set of lectures can be used uh, as uh, the learning activities. The students study the material in preparation for the team-based learning session. Whereas staff, as I mentioned earlier, the facilitator, he or she need to plan and organize the session. They have to uh, construct two sets of questions, valid and reliable, again, very important. Uh, how we prepare these questions 
the first set of questions at C2 level or cognitive 2 level of uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, which is based on the comprehension, and second set based on the application analysis and evaluating. What I do mostly in my sessions is that I prepare between 10 and 20 uh, single best answer questions uh, for the first set and three to five extended magic questions uh, for the uh, uh, team application uh, level. Uh, also prepare tables for entering the students' answers along with model answers, both for group uh, readiness assurance test and, and team application. This is one example of a table where we can enter the students' results, uh, where you can see the, the, the questions, uh, numbers, the model answers given here, and here we can enter the results of, uh, of the teams, whether it is a group readiness assurance test or team application test. But this is just one way. There are many other ways of uh, going through, through this step. Now, second, identification of uh, small groups. So important here is that we do not allow students to uh, choose their own groups. Uh, we prefer to um, uh, make these groups ourselves because then we want to have a good mix of, uh, of students, uh, higher achiever, uh, high achievers, low achievers, diverse, female, female, and the ethnic groups and uh, make the group process transparent. So students should, uh, should not have complaints why they were uh, assigned to, to a certain group. Uh, so example like top uh, five, bottom five mix, or gender mix, race mix, discipline mix. And then we can maintain this group for a term or a semester. So um, uh, we don't need to make these groups for every session because we need to develop group dynamics as well. So one group can be made, uh, maintained for a term or, or a semester. And let students choose their representative leader or spokesperson, and this can be different students for, uh, for different sessions. Step three, the individual readiness assurance test. So each individual student completes a set of questions of the, uh, the set one, uh, which I said uh, I generally use the single best answer question. And these questions focus on the understanding of concepts they need to uh, uh, master in order to be able to solve the theme application uh, test or EMQs properly. Basically, these uh, BAQs are meant to prepare the students so that they can attempt the theme application, which is uh, extended magic questions in, in, in this example, uh, in the next step. So once the students have gone through this individual readiness assurance test and their answers uh, can be collected, and these answers may be used for continuous assessment uh, purpose if the institution des and decides to uh, do, do that. The step four, which is the group readiness assurance test, and it is the same set of questions which the students have answered individually. Now they have to answer as a group. Uh, and the group must answer them through a consensus building discussion. And this is the opportunity for uh, peer learning where students learn from uh, each other and uh, discuss and come to a common answer. The, so once they have done that, we fill the answers in the table for each group uh, and compare with the uh, model answer, the table as I have shown you earlier, and that can be projected. And then is that uh, there are, uh, as I said, apart from table, there are many other methods show the card method or scratch cards or uh, the audience response uh, system, which are clickers, which even the handphones can, can use that. Although the problem in this is that we would not be able to uh, trace the, the respondent. 
So here is that example. Now the, the students' answers have been filled in. The model answers are here, and these are the, 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 the questions, and, and these are the groups. So this is how it looks like. The step six is now students are given clarification by the lecturer. Now, this is important here. That this is step is mainly done by the facilitator or the lecturer uh, they, with the minimal involvement of the students uh, because we want to save time here for the next uh, important step. So the both right and wrong answers are discussed why right answer is right and why wrong answers are right, um, wrong and uh, answering any queries by the students by, by, by the lecturer. Now at the end of the clarification review, students should feel confident that they are adequately prepared to solve more complex problems. So this is to prepare them for team application test. And that is the, the step seven. So, and this is the most important step. Students in teams are presented with a scenario, uh, EMQs, uh, that is similar to the type of problem they will be grappling with during their careers. So here is, uh, we believe that students have learned the concept in up to step six, and now they should be in a position to apply their knowledge to handle or solve these, uh, these problems, which are uh, being presented in at this stage. The team application structure follows the, what is, we call is four S's principle. Number one, it has to be a significant problem. The question must address important, significant, and common problems. The selected problem and the associated questions must be important, authentic, and realistic. Uh, and uh, it could be the same problem for all the teams. The, the same questions uh, are being handled by all the teams. And it has to be a specific choice, probing the why of the concept and our use of a set of data for interpretation. And fourth S is simultaneous report. So teams report their answers at the same time. Uh, so they, 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 they cannot copy from, from each other. And this makes teams accountable for reaching and being prepared to defend uh, their decision. <laughs> Students are challenged at this stage, this step seven, to make interpretations calculations, predictions, analysis, synthesis of given information, and make a specific choice from a range of options and explain or defend their choice uh, uh, to the class if asked to do so. Now, important here is they have to make a choice. So they are given uh, options and they have to make a choice. We do not expect them to write essays here that they would not, uh, would not be able to uh, fit into, into this. It's not an assignment. So that's why I, uh, I prefer to use extended matching questions. So that is to assess their ability to solve the problems. And at the same time, uh, they are given choices to, to uh, pick up the answer rather than uh, asking them to to write, uh, write uh, an essay. Again, it's the same table of the students. Now the team application results are, are uh, uh, put in, in the table. And then is the discussion. Now here at this stage, the major role is played by the students and not by the facilitator. If you look at the uh, group readiness assurance test, the major role was being played by the facilitator and the lecturer, but not at this stage. Because now we think students have gone through the concept, they have understood uh, the concept, and now we want to see their ability to apply that concept to this particular problem or situation. 
So here major role is played by the students and there is not much uh, input uh, by the lecturer except when it is really, really needed. Both right and wrong answers are discussed by the students among different teams. Answering any queries by students, by students. So if students have any questions, uh, the facilitator would encourage the other students, uh, other teams to, uh, to address those uh, queries and answers. And of course, their team uh, has to explain the, the basis of, uh, of their choice of answer. So then is the step 10, which is the wrap up session. And here is the lecturer who would summarize the concept uh, and the, its application. Any doubts are there, they uh, would clear it, uh, reinforce the right understanding and clearly state the take home message. An important contribution uh, by the facilitator at, at this stage. The debriefing or feedback is uh, another important step, uh, feedback to peers within the team and the feedback on the role of the team in the learning process and feedback on the whole process, uh, learning experience and own personal role. Uh, generally, this point would be, um, uh, uh, the lecturer would, would give the feedback on the, on the whole process and may ask some students to uh, to, to contribute. Uh, and then the peer evaluation where students evaluate uh, their uh, peers. Now, we cannot be doing this in for every session. Uh, they, usually we choose, um, uh, let's say after every three, four uh, session, we choose uh, uh, this uh, kind of feedback where the peer evaluation uh, structured feedback is used. And uh, for example, what is the single most valuable contribution this person makes to your team? And uh, what is the single most important thing this person could do to mo uh, more effectively? Basically, the purpose is to improve the, the uh, team collaboration and teamwork. Uh, appeal is another important component where uh, some students may not agree uh, with the best answer provided by, by the lecturer and they may uh, make an appeal and uh, they can uh, offer an alternate answer to, to the best answer. The team must either provide a clear and usable rewrite of the question if they think it's a poorly worded. Students may think the question was ambiguous so they have to give an alternate, uh, alternative uh, statement or they have to justify and explain why they think that the answer they are providing is best or is uh, equally important as has been chosen by the, the lecturer. Uh, only team that takes the steps to write an appeal is eligible to receive credit uh, for that particular question. <coughs> So keep the turnaround time as brief as possible. Uh, the, uh, so the, even the next uh, possible session, the, the decisions should be announced. So if I want to summarize uh, these events, uh, free reading by students, preparation of two sets of questions by the teachers. Students answer first set of questions individually. Students discuss the first set of questions among themselves and answer the questions as a group. Students and teacher discuss the first set of questions and answers. Students are given second set of questions. Students discuss among themselves and answer second set of questions as a group. And second set of questions and answers are discussed among students and the teacher. So this is uh, the summary of the events which uh, take place in, in one uh, TBL session. So just a few tips how we can uh, make uh, these uh, TBL sessions more effective and more practical, especially because we have uh, some uh, participants who are already uh, 
conducting these uh, these PBL session. So first one, explain the answer to the question of readiness assurance test, rather than asking the students to do so because uh, we do not want to spend so much time here uh, so that we can uh, uh, do the next step, especially the team application uh, more elaborately. So here we, uh, the lecturer can, can uh, play a major role rather than asking students to explain their answer. Second tip, monitor the students' uh, discussion carefully. Do not lose the track. Unnecessary lengthy discussion brings boredom and do not allow the repetition of the same uh, argument because we want to use the time uh, most productively. Use scenario as real as possible, especially the uh, EMQs. Address important questions, not minor print. And do not forget to wrap up the session um, uh, smartly. That is important because that would be really the take home message of which uh, students uh, need to be very clear about. Let the students randomly to speak. Although there are uh, uh, no students uh, uh, spokesperson, but we can still uh, ask other students to answer. I usually uh, do that. I uh, have the attendance sheet of the students in front of me and I can pick up different names and ask the students to, to answer. And the purpose is that it's not only the spokesperson who is ready to answer, but other members are also ready to, to answer. Make a rule that anyone who speaks to the whole class must stand up or use a microphone. Uh, uh, get in the habit of moving away from the student who is speaking so that he or she will uh, speak louder. Otherwise, students tend to answer uh, to the lecturer and not uh, to, to their, their uh, teammates or other students. So, uh, inspire them to speak to the other teams, uh, not to you. Go for quality of questions and not quantity. And uh, uh, it would be good practice to uh, discuss those questions with your colleagues if uh, it's not possible to have a proper vetting. Uh, you do not need to cover all the content. And the uh, trust the process. If you design questions that really make students think and struggle with making a decision, uh, for sure they would read the, the whole thing very carefully. So that's uh, the, uh, uh, the description of, uh, of uh, the, the, the TBL process. Now coming to the steps of a PBL session. So uh, uh, as I see from the survey, a majority of the participants, they are already conducting these, uh, these PBL sessions. So there are some steps before the PBL session is conducted. And first is preparation of a PBL package uh, by a group of uh, academicians. Second step is facilitators go through the PBL package. Third, facilitators meeting. The facilitators need to meet before the PBL session so they can plan the session properly and they have a common understanding uh, on how to conduct the session. Identification of students groups and their facilitators and allocation of PBL rooms. So these are the five steps which are needed before we conduct a TBL session. And then the facilitators, they collect the PBL triggers from the academic office on the day when the PBL is, is going to be conducted. Now steps during the PBL session, students, first students choose a chairperson and a scribe. Facilitator hands over the trigger to the chairperson for distribution to the participants. Scribe notes important discussion points on the board. Chairperson requests a student to read the trigger. Students clarify the text of the problem or clarification of new terms. Students identify and list 
the fact stated and students define the problem so that everybody has the uh, similar uh, concept and the same concept uh, about the problem. Then students brainstorm to find explanations for the phenomena or the facts observed in the problem. Students identify the learning needs, that's the gaps uh, in their knowledge, which they would identify while they are trying to uh, the brainstorm and explain uh, the, the phenomena. Students work independently. Of, so at this stage, the first session is over and students then uh, go out and work independently or in a group to achieve the learning needs and they reconvene at another day uh, to discuss the problem in the light of newly acquired knowledge. Again, there is a debriefing session. Now, uh, those are the, the steps of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, PBL uh, session. Uh, I'll give you a, a comparison between PBL and the PBL towards the uh, end of uh, uh, this session. First, the challenges uh, which we face during TBL session. The first one is pre-reading and assignment by the students. So uh, that may be a problem because not everybody may, may come prepared. But if we use uh, uh, this the, the individual readiness assurance test as a part of continuous assessment, uh, that would be a good stimulus for students to read and uh, be ready before coming in. Uh, preparation of valid and reliable questions for uh, two sets the, is again a challenge for the, for the lecturer. As I said, we don't prefer to go for the number, but the quality uh, of the questions. Uh, coping with number of students, um, uh, let's, say, let's say up to 100, 120 students, uh, a, we can conduct uh, one TBL session. But if the student number is more than that, then you may have to divide them into two, two groups. And then managing the session, pointing out the hidden, hidden students, means the students who are keep, keeping quiet, not take, uh, participating. So uh, encourage them to, to participate. Similarly, the, there are some challenges in a PBL session. Here we saw the TBL session, no challenges for PBL session. Uh, preparation of PBL package is the challenge of proper PBL session, and that uh, takes a lot of time. And uh, where number of lecturers from different uh, disciplines need to be involved. Uh, training of facilitators is very important. The, that plays a very crucial role in PBL, how facilitators conduct the session, uh, the, especially if there are subject experts and, and non-experts. Uh, of course, motivation of students to participate and coping with number of students, uh, the, uh, obviously, uh, we prefer the group uh, in PBL about eight to 10 students. So if the large number of students, so you need to have large number of uh, uh, groups. So means uh, so many staff members being involved and managing the session, similarly uh, pointing out the hidden students and participation. Right, so these are, are the references for this, but the, the, uh, I, I, let me stop sharing this and share the the other document which uh, I want to uh, show you. Uh, sorry, it's the, the uh, yes. Okay, yeah, this one. Um, is the screen visible? Yes, yes, right. Both. right. Okay. Now, this is the table which I have prepared to compare the, the PBL and the TBL. And the first is preparation for the session. Uh, if you see, there are very major differences between the two approaches. In PBL, no reading material is provided to the students. 
whereas in TBL, reading materials are provided to the students. In PBL, no learning outcomes are provided to the students. They have to identify their own learning needs, whereas in TBL, the learning outcomes are provided to the students. In PBL, students must come, um, uh, uh, come unprepared. Uh, they do not know actually what is going to be discussed, whereas in TBL, students come prepared and they uh, know what is going to be discussed. In PBL, faculty need to prepare a PBL package, whereas in TBL, facilitator need to plan the session and prepare two sets of questions, uh, as I mentioned earlier. In PBL, facilitators go through the PBL package and they have a discussion with other facilitators about the conduct and content of the session whereas in TBL, the facilitator may discuss with other colleagues and may accept their suggestion. So this is for the preparation of the session. When it comes to the conduct of the session, in PBL, the group size is eight to 10, whereas in TBL, it's really four to six. Uh, in PBL, facilitator is not a subject expert. But in TBL, the facilitator has to be the subject expert. That's very important point here. Uh, in PBL, one facilitator for each group. So you need uh, uh, manpower here uh, based on the number of uh, PBL groups. You may need number of facilitators, whereas in TBL, only one facilitator is needed for uh, all the groups. Uh, similarly, for uh, PBL, multiple PBL rooms are required, whereas TBL is one classroom with roundtable seating required. In PBL, students need to choose a chairperson and a scribe, whereas uh, students in TBL, students need to choose a spokesperson. In PBL, facilitator mainly coordinates the session and gives very little input. Whereas in TBL, facilitator coordinates the session as well get, as gives a significant academic input. And that's why uh, uh, the, the subject expert is needed to facilitate the TBL. Both need uh, active involvement of the students. Uh, in PBL, students identify their learning needs, whereas in TBL, learning needs are provided to the students. And in PBL, it requires more than one session, at least two sessions. Students need to study in between the session, whereas in TBL, it's uh, only one session and typically there is no homework. And post-conduct, after the session, uh, both uh, uh, PBL and TBL, they need a debriefing session. Uh, PBL feedback given to the students, both on individual and group uh, level. Similarly, feedback uh, given mainly to the group level in, in TBL. And the PBL can be used as part of continuous assessment. Similarly, uh, TBL can also be used as part of continuous uh, uh, assessment. And TBL gives a student uh, an opportunity of appeal where this is not needed in PBL. So I think that's the, the end of uh, uh, my uh, presentation. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Uh, at the same time, a little bit of uh, advertisement. Uh, I do conduct uh, this, uh, uh, webinars on uh, medical education uh, uh, regularly on monthly basis, uh, uh, which are free for everybody. And the next one is on 11th of uh, December. And uh, the topic is construction and conduct of uh, multi-part uh, uh, MEQ. Uh, we have a large group of uh, participants in these uh, MEDED webinars. We have more than 2,500 members and uh, every month we conduct uh, uh, one session. Uh, if you are interested, uh, the 
the link is given uh, in, in the bottom of uh, uh, this slide and you can join uh, this session if you like. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Prof. Maybe you can uh, WhatsApp me the link so that I can disseminate. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think uh, I'll, I'll uh, share these slides with you so that you can send to uh, to all, all, all the participants. Uh, uh, I, I'll send you after this. this session. Thanks, Prof. Thanks. So, any any questions or comments uh, uh, from from anybody? Yes, uh, uh, Prof. Yeah. New. Yeah, problem. It is a very good and practically uh, appropriate uh, lecture, and then I do uh, enjoy. Number one is selection of the group. You see, you do not, we do not allow the student to uh, select themselves. And then the last is appeal. You see, uh, yeah. then you give the student a chance to appeal. Very attractive, and then and very right. yeah. okay. Yeah. And then uh, uh, on on your introduction, I just uh, uh, said that uh, we are going to have the task based learning and BBL section this section, and then I understand, but not understand that because we we usually have the task based learning, and then this team based learning is uh, actually it's a group of task task. Right. It, is, uh, uh, it is it is what you call handled by the group and collaboration you see in your slide also we have the collaboration the hands is hand together actually right. good sign also so that actually uh, but we we are in 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 this university we have task based learning All right. okay. and okay. then my question is what is the difference between uh, uh, task based learning and team based learning All right. Okay, now you can take uh, team-based learning as one example of a task-based learning. Yeah. Because, because uh, you are giving them a task, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned, may, may be an assignment, may be a video, may be an activity uh, in the community. Uh, so it's, it's a task. And then the, the, we have to follow certain uh, certain steps so that the, the learning takes place in a systematic manner rather than haphazard. Yeah. So this task, uh, the, uh, although I gave uh, the example of let's say uh, assignment, but this task can be the, the, something in the community, something in the hospital, something in the clinic, uh, maybe a clinical situation, how to handle that situation. Uh, and the, the, the advantage of task based is that it might involve some hands-on things. And that might involve, for example, your clinical skill lab, something related to, to clinical skill lab. If you take uh, here, the, the, what we have discussed is team-based learning, as this assignment as a task, I think the same principles, same principles we can apply to, to other tasks. Uh, but obviously we have to work very carefully uh, while uh, you know, framing the questions and the structure based on the task. Uh, if our task is an assignment or a chapter, uh, then this is kind of standard that we go through these steps, except the questions would be different. But whereas uh, task-based learning, if the task, of course, can vary very, very differently, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the whole session needs to be, to be planned carefully. I think that might be more meticulous and more work required to take full advantage of, uh, of the task you have identified. Uh, yes, very, very clear. Actually, for the uh, 
uh, for the task based learning, sometimes you see we define the task, but not sometimes uh, they will walk individually and then meet uh, uh, what you call at the seminar or yeah. conference room as well. But this team based learning, I enjoyed more because you see we more emphasize on the group work rather yeah. than the individual task. Yeah. Then because, they will train. Because, Prof, this yeah. is very well defined. Yeah, well defined. Yeah, very, very well defined. Whereas the if it is a task, then you have to really work separately for each task. Yeah. And you have to plan very, very carefully so yeah. that you can take full advantage of that. Uh, that may be very attractive, but I'm sure would be very, very meticulous uh, work to be done. Yeah. And then that task base will eventually they, they have to work in team. But what you call uh, uh, this thing based learning is what you call, uh, we have on the start, we make uh, them do in team. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Very uh, clear. Right. Yeah. Any, any yes. Ang here. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting and informative talk. Um, recently, we, we do heard about the terminology of modified PBL. Um, perhaps uh, Prof can give us some uh, lights on what is the difference between the modified PBL and the conventional PBL mm -hmm. that we, we, we are been using and doing it. Yeah, thank you. Right. Uh, actually, uh, PBL has very variations. The, uh, the PBL which started from McMaster to begin with uh, was very, very different than what, what uh, we see now. And you see the, the uh, PBL and then it's, um, uh, the, uh, it's, it's different formats, uh, people doing uh, uh, in two sessions, people doing in, in three sessions. Unfortunately, there is no really standard, no clear cut um, steps. Although I, I mentioned that steps that for two sessions, now some people want to do it in three sessions. So uh, then it, it, it uh, go, goes differently. Uh, the, and uh, now the, if you talk about modified PBL, uh, again, there is no specific, as far as uh, I know, there is no specific outline for modified PBL because uh, every institution is uh, is modifying according to, to their own way. The big issue, though, is that the, the what, what we say, the, the focus point. Uh, in PBL, unfortunately, uh, we sort of uh, lose the track and we start uh, an attempt to solve the problem. Whereas original concept is to learn from the problem. And I think that is one major um, issue which uh, different institutions are, uh, are facing because to solve the problem is an attractive approach. Students are very keen to to solve the problem, uh, whereas the actual purpose is not to solve the problem, but to learn from that problem. And the result is that at the end of the day, uh, as you will see many people complained that uh, we, we forget about the basic sciences, which is, uh, is important part to be, to be learned at that. And we go more for uh, uh, clinical and those kind of things. So in short, uh, there is no one definition of, uh, uh, of uh, let's say, modified PBL. There's no, no standard definition. Uh, many people are modifying it to, to their own uh, uh, situation and the concept. Hello. I, I hope that answers yeah. your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Malik. Thank you. Right. Any any other uh, question or uh, comment? 
if none i thank you for uh, your uh, attention and for giving me this opportunity yes dr Hello. dr farooq yes dr. yes sir yes, am sir. i audible sir uh, yes yes sir <laughs> sir what i understand by this task based learning and uh, ppl uh, what is the difference between task based learning and self directed learning stl no stl is part of pbl or oh. part of tbl because okay. when you are going through pbl or tbl uh, or task based learning you identify your learning needs the gaps in your knowledge and okay. that those you are when you, you know each student might have different learning needs so that becomes basis of your self directed learning so it is uh, so sbl is a major part of uh, pbl and task based learning okay sir. thank you so it's addressing your own learning needs at your own time using your own favorite resources that's what the definition of self directed learning okay thank you very much sir. Thank you. right thank you very much everybody i really enjoyed that session hope to see you sometimes uh, face to face good evening good evening thank you prof thank you prof thank you sir Uh, before uh, you leave, I'll uh, just uh, give some uh, closing remarks, Prof. Uh, yes, So, uh, thanks again, Prof. Alam Shir Malik for the excellent talk and highlighting the nuances of the PBL and TBL. So, to summarize uh, your talk, you explained patiently about 12 steps of the TBL approach as well as gave us some practical tips uh, then you explain the five steps of PBL and the process of problem-based learning. And you also highlighted that there is uh, no uh, consensus on how to ideally conduct a PBL and every institution is following their own ways to suit themselves. Uh, then you compared the TBL and PBL and clearly outlined their differences as well as you mentioned about the challenges in conducting TBL and PBL, and finally uh, answered all the queries calmly. So thanks uh, everyone for joining today. We hope uh, to put the knowledge learned today into practice, into our day-to-day -day teaching. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, and thank you, uh, Sumarjit Singh. I will... Um... Uh, what, uh, send you through WhatsApp the the, the copy of the slides and uh, uh, you can share with uh, with all the participants and there would be the last slide would have the link for the the next webinar if you are interested to join. Sure, Prof. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.